Our next lab is about using the buzzer that's on the PIC demo board. In order to do that, we're going to have to make sense of how buzzers work, how sound works, and how to send a sound from the micro to the buzzer. So I'm going to skip past the proposed answers and come back to them. And start off with what exactly sound is. Here's an example of the kind of circuit you could use to um, create a sound. As you can see, this represents a speaker, and you might, represent, you might recognize this as the inductor symbol. What they're trying to tell you is that a speaker is basically a coil of wire. That coil of wire is attached to a paper cone, and the, um, uh, sorry, the coil of wire is right next to a magnet. The magnet's attached to the paper cone, and as the magnetic field of the um, coil expands and contracts, it makes the magnet inside the speaker pull back and push forward and pull back and push forward, and that makes the paper cone inside the speaker push, pull back and push forward, which pushes the air molecule that's right here, which bumps into the air molecule that's right here, which bumps into the air molecules that are uh, next to them, until eventually one of those air molecule neighbors hits you in the ear, and that vibrates your eardrum, and that's what we consider sound. So all that needs to happen for sound is that your eardrum has to actually move back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Um, the further the motion, in other words, the bigger the swing from its further, between its furthest points, the louder the sound. That's called amplitude, uh, just like it is in, uh, in any other wave. Um, but the more often per second it goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, controls the pitch. So in humans, the audible range of frequencies is approximately 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. That'll be very different from individual to individual. Uh, as you get older, you lose that high end. But basically, a 20 hertz sound should be a very low sound. And a 20 kilohertz sound should be shriekingly, piercingly, painfully high-pitched. Now you can see in this circuit, uh, what they're basically doing is they're feeding a square wave into the base of a transistor, which should, uh, and, and all we're going to do is we're going to saturate it and cut it off, and that should make current flow and stop and flow and stop, which should make this inductor develop a big magnetic field and then collapse that magnetic field and develop a big magnetic field and collapse it. So they're suggesting a square wave. That's not super crucial. It's just easy. They're suggesting a 50% a duty cycle, right? A one-half duty cycle. Again, not crucial, just easy. Um, and specifically, the duty cycle is not related to pitch. The only thing that's related to pitch is frequency. So if this is a one kilohertz um, frequency, in other words, this was one millisecond from this rising edge to this rising edge, uh, that would, uh, a one kilohertz tone is not horrible. It sounds like ee or something in that ballpark. Uh, but if you made it a two kilohertz uh, square wave, in other words, you know, you had twice as many of these ups and downs, the squares were all half the size, then it would sound like ee. And if you uh, made it so that there was half as many ups and downs, right? If it, the uh, high time lasted all the way over here and then the low time lasted all the way over here, it would sound like ooh. Uh, and that is true regardless of whether you have a 50% duty cycle or a 70% duty cycle or whatever, because all your ears are detecting, what your auditory nerves are sending to your brain is how many times did your eardrum uh, push outwards, which, um, uh, sorry, push inwards, which probably happens on the rising edge, and then pull back outwards, which happens on the falling edge. As long as you've got a rising edge and a falling edge, you've got a sound. So, uh, that uh, tells me basically how to change the pitch of the buzzer. So then we go and look at oscillators because basically all we have to do is output a square wave to a transistor uh, and uh, that has a speaker attached to it, which is exactly what we have on the PIC demo board. And as long as we're outputting a square wave and we can control the frequency, we should be able to make it make noise. Um, and then we look at what oscillators do we have available in our um, micro? And it turns out that we have these frequencies available. Now there are a couple of different oscillator circuits inside the micro. Let's go take a quick look. So as you can see, there's an oscillator down here at 32 kilohertz, and there's the main internal oscillator block up here. Uh, so let's go back to the data sheet section. This is from chapter four in the data sheet. Uh, that main oscillator block has these frequencies available. The lowest one is 125 kilohertz. 
not, well, here's the 31 kilohertz in your secondary low frequency oscillator. Not helpful. Remember, uh, we need a frequency that is below 20 kilohertz. And in fact, even 20 kilohertz, most people who are above five years old won't be able to hear. So these oscillators, uh, although we could send them to the buzzer, they would buzz at frequencies that maybe a dog can hear or maybe a bat. Uh, there's a special function register called OSCON, right? We're looking at uh, the OSCON register description. Uh, and it controls the speed of the system clock, which is an oscillator, but they're not in human range. So I guess we can't do that. Next option. We're going to use the pulse width modulator in a sort of a sideways manner. We've been talking about pulse width modulators and how they are intended to uh, output um, a changeable duty cycle. Now, I just went on and on about how in a sound, it doesn't, the duty cycle is of no consequence. It doesn't matter whether it's on for 50% of the time. We're going to use the pulse width modulator anyway, for one and only one reason. Besides being able to control its pulse width, we are also able to control its frequency, and we're going to be able to turn it down to a low enough frequency that we can hear it. So, uh, we're using the PWM, but sort of not using any of the features that PWMs are normally used for. That's all right. So here is how you control the pulse width modulator. Uh, it is controlled by these four registers. And it's part of a section called Capture Compare PWM, or CCP. So that's the block in the block diagram that we're looking at. And here we go. Here's our second CCP. Uh, and it has a pin attached to it called CCP2. And we also have... Uh, the first CCP, which has special features. So it's called, the, um, I think it's extended or enhanced CCP. Uh, so we could use either one, uh, but I think in this case, we're actually going to use this one and not because we need its fancy features, just because it's convenient. And it uh, gives me a chance to run you through some of, um, sort of get for you guys to get a sense of what uh, a capture control pulse width modulator can do. So, uh, we will have to dig into those four registers. Let's see what we've got here. Aha! This explains a little bit about what those registers do. So we need to control the period of the pulse width modulator because that's basically how we're going to control the frequency. And the period is specified by a register called PR2. Now we're actually going to be using uh, a timer to generate the clock pulses that the pulse width modulator is based on. So the timer 2 block and its period 2 register are feeding in to our PWM. Let's take a look on the block diagram. So here's our CCP module. Remember the P stands for pulse width modulator. Here's timer 2 and we're going to put timer 2 uh, is going to output some pulses. We're going to put those on the data bus and feed them in to the pulse width modulator, which is over here. Period is really the key thing that we need to care about, uh, and there's a formula here uh, that lets us set the period so that it matches up with a frequency that we are interested in. Uh, we'll also have to give it a pulse width because it has to have some pulse width, but that's not really the key part of what we're doing here. Uh, in general, we'll probably set that pulse width to 50% just because we have to set it to something. So here's the details of how we control the period. First of all, we need to know about this oscillator. T stands for period, right, for, because it's time. So this is the oscillator period. Okay, great, but which oscillator period? When it says this in the data sheet, they're talking about the main system oscillator. We'll talk more about what that actually does, but for now, I need you to know that there is a main system oscillator and you can control its uh, frequency. I'll show it to you on the block diagram. So here's your main internal oscillator block. We're actually going to take that internal oscillator, put it on the bus, feed it into timer two. We'll use timer two to actually cut that down because the internal oscillator normally runs at, well, those are the times, the, the speeds that I was showing you a moment ago. Let's go back there. The main oscillator runs at these speeds, too fast, but we're gonna feed them into timer two. Timer two is gonna cut them down and then feed the cut down pulses into the pulse width modulator. So if we look back down here, we're going to take our main oscillator speed, which could be any of those values we were just looking at. Could be, for example, uh, 4 megahertz, which is the default value. You take that 4 megahertz, you need to figure out 
its period. So since uh, there are four million pulses in a second, each pulse must last one four millionth of a second. So I'm going to find that one divided by four million, and that is uh, 250 nanoseconds is our oscillator period. Uh, you take that value, you multiply it by four, and multiply it by um, the value, uh, the limit that the timer is going to count up to, and the prescale value that you're using, and that'll give you the period of your, that should work out to the period that you want. So if you know that you need a period of one millisecond, for example, to make a one kilohertz tone, you're going to have to put one uh, millisecond in here and then come up with numbers that make that work out. Uh, the oscillator frequency is fixed, right? Because you have to choose an oscillator frequency that actually exists within the micro. We're going to, I'm going to assume four um, megahertz uh, since that's the default value. You have to use four. You have some control. We have lots of control over PR2. You can basically put any number in here that um, makes your circuit work the way you want it to. Timer to prescaler, uh, that you can change, but you have limits to the number of options. So since both of these things relate to the timer to block, let's go take a look. So remember that timer two is going to take the four megahertz signal from the oscillator and its job is to chop it down before it feeds it to um, the pulse width modulator because four megahertz is way too high for us to hear. Let's take a look inside timer two to see how that chopping down happens. Okay, so here is our oscillator being fed into the timer two. A prescaler a prescaler is uh, a little circuit inside the timer block that um, only passes on some of the pulses. So you can set it to only pass on one out of every four pulses, one out of every 16 pulses, or every single pulse. We're probably going to pass on one out of every 16 pulses because we don't need it to be that fast. Then what happens is uh, this TMR2 rectangle represents a register just like port B is a register or TRIS B is a register. So that's eight flip-flops, and that's going to count up. It counts up every time it gets a pulse from the prescaler. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, and so on like that. So it's a special counter register. PR2 is the value you want it to count up until. So let's say you put 11 in here. Then timer 2 will count, and the comparator will check. Are you equal to PR2? No, because it's only one. Then it counts up to two. Are you equal? No. Then it counts up to three every time it gets a pulse from the prescaler. Are you equal to 11? No. And it's going to keep doing that until it gets to 11. Uh, and then it is going to output that value. So PR2 controls how many pulses it counts up to. And the prescaler controls how many pulses from the internal oscillator it's going to ignore. So I know I'm probably going to put 16 in here for the prescale value. I'm probably going to put um, 250 nanoseconds in here for the oscillator um, period. I definitely am going to put 4 in here. And I'm going to put 1 megahertz, I'm sorry, 1 kilohertz in here uh, to make a tone that I can actually hear. Then I'm going to solve for PR2. I'm going to figure out what value of PR2 do I need so that this formula works out to 1 kilohertz. That should cause my pulse width modulator to output um, a frequency that I can actually hear and send it to the buzzer. So if we scroll down here, there's a little bit more description of how exactly the prescaler works. And here Verl is explaining uh, the timer 2 module very much in the same way I just did. Uh, and here we have the actual register description for the timer to control register. Now be careful, that's not the TMR2 register that we were just looking at. So as you can see in the timer to block diagram, this T2 con register is not shown here anywhere. TMR2 is the register that counts up. T2 con is the one that sort of behind the scenes controls how the entire timer block works. For example, that's where you control what prescaler and postscaler you're going to use, right? If you want that prescaler to be a 1 to 16 prescaler, you need to take bits 0 and 1 of this register 
and make them be uh, one and something. It can be one and one or one and zero, it doesn't matter. As long as you have a one in that position, uh, right, let's go back to full screen. As long as you have a one in this position right here, then you have a one to 16 prescaler. It's a little tricky to read this register diagram, so uh, let me just break that down a little bit. What they're telling you here is that bits zero and one have a name together. So timer two, clock, prescale, select is these two bits right here. You obviously need to turn timer two on. This is this bit right here, the timer two on bit. And you have to give a value to the timer two post scaler. Interestingly, we are not going to use the post scaler at all because it's not available when you feed it into the PWM. Uh, so you can put any bits in here that you like into this timer two output post scaler select group of bits. What they're telling you here is that um, bits three through six have this name timer output post scaler select. So that's how you set the frequency of timer two. The next thing we need to do is we need to take that timer two frequency and send it to the pulse width modulator. So we remember that the pulse width modulator is part of a, a block called CCP. Let's go back and look. This is it right here, the extended compare capture pulse width modulator block. It's going to get its uh, clock pulses from timer two, and it has four pins associated with it, which is important because we need to be able to output that um, square wave to our external buzzer. So the last thing we need to do is understand the command that tells it to output that pulse into the outside world. You do that using the CCP1 control register, and I'm going to walk you through how to read it. It's usually easiest to read from right to left using the least significant bits first, so that's what I'm going to do. First of all, that controls the mode. Remember that this isn't just a pulse with modulator block. It's a PWM and also a comparator and also a thing called capture. We're not even using those modes, so you definitely don't want to set up these bits, right, bits three through zero, to use a mode that you're not planning on using. So you have to, in those four bits, put one of these codes that controls a pulse with modulator. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to use uh, only one of those four pins. We're going to use P1A. We could be using P1B, P1D, and P1C, but it's easiest to use P1A. So I kind of don't care what's happening to the rest of them. But I do want P1A to be active high. Uh, in other words, uh, if I set it up for a 75% duty cycle, I want um, the pin to be on for 75% of the time. If you set it up for an active low duty cycle, then if you uh, a 75% means that the pin will be low for 75% of the time. It's not crucial because we're using a buzzer, uh, which as I mentioned earlier, is kind of almost doesn't even need a pulse width modulator at all. But you do need to know what it means and what it does so that next time you're using pulse width modulator, you're not confused. Uh, so I suggest using the active high settings uh, of P1A. So since both of these two modes make both P1A and P1C active high, it kind of doesn't matter whether we choose code 1100 or whether we choose code 1101. Both will work. So that's what bits 0 through 3 do. Next, uh, we these two bits control the are part of controlling the duty cycle. You might remember that there was a math formula up earlier in the presentation about how to set up a 50% duty cycle, and I skipped over it. I'll come back to that in another screencast. Um, but do know that there are two bits in here that are involved. Last but not least, we want to take that output and send it to a pin. So. The pin we're using is P1A, and uh, we want that to be a single output. We want P1A to be modulated, and since we're not using P1B, C, or D, you can release them and allow them to be used as regular general purpose I.O. port pins. 
So this is the code you want right here. And what they're telling you here in all this gobbledygook is, first of all, we're talking about bits 7 and 6 here, these two bits here. We're going to put a code in there, but those codes are only available if CCP1M bits 3 and 2 are equal to this. So, holy smoke, what is CCP1M? Well, it's this thing down here. And you see how it's four bits long? So the least significant bit is bit zero, and the next is bit one, and the next is bit two, and the next is bit three. So what they're saying here is if bits two and three of this thing are one, one, then these options are available. Well, you'll take, you'll notice that whenever the two top bits of uh, CCP1M the mode select bits. Whenever those are both ones, we happen to be in PWM mode. So really what they're saying in English here is if you're not using the PWM, then this these two bits don't matter. But if you are using the PWM, then these two bits can be assigned in one of four ways to control how many of those four pins are modulated. We only want to modulate one. We are in one of the PWM modes. So putting 00, zero into these two bits should cause, cause PWA, P1A to be modulated, the other three to be released. And if we go look at them on the pinout, here is pin P1A. It is pin number 17. Now we will be using that one. That's what we're actually going to connect to our speaker to make it speak. But here's P1B, P1C, and P1D. And you can see that if they're not in use as part of the pulse width modulator, you can release them to be part of port D and you can just use them to turn on LEDs or whatever you like. And that's exactly what we're going to do by using this 00 code right here in the CCP1 control register. So those are the steps you have to go through in order to take the internal oscillator from the micro, send it to timer 2, get timer 2 to cut it down to a frequency we can actually hear, send that to the compare capture pulse width modulator uh, unit, and then program the pulse width modulator to actually output that signal on one of its pins and release the other three. The very last thing uh, to take a look at is how to control the duty cycle, uh, which is not crucial, but we do have to tell it to be something. So I will cover that in the next screencast. But for now, this was how to set your buzzers.